Hi everyone, I'm Joanna Penn from thecreativepen.com and today I'm here with KM Wyland. Hi Katie. Hi, thank you for having me today. Oh, no worries at all. Just a little introduction. Katie is an award-winning and best-selling historical and speculative fiction author. She also writes non-fiction and runs the popular site helpingwritersbecomeauthors.com. And today we're focusing on her book, Conquering Writer's Block and Summoning Inspiration, Learn to Nurture a Lifestyle of Creativity, which is a fantastic title. <laughs> Yes, thank you. Sometimes actually I get writer's block more on titles, I think, than I do on anything. <laughs> that is a really good point, and we might come back to title later. Um, but I, I wanted to just um, just start by, I guess, asking you a bit more about you and your writing background, because we've known each other online for years. You've, you've been, we've done video interviews before, but just give everyone a sort of overview of who you are and what you get up to. <laughs> yeah, well, I like to say that um, stories are my language. So it's one of those things that I've just I've always I've always been a storyteller. My earliest memory is actually of myself up in a treehouse at a family reunion telling myself a story. So it was just sort of an progression to go into um, writing fiction. I write um, primarily fantasy and historical fiction, and usually some kind of weird combination of both of them. And I have four novels out now, and I have I also do a lot of um, nonfiction writing, how to for authors. So I have um, eight nonfiction writing how-to books out now, I think at this point. And um, it's pretty much just an outgrowth of my website, um, Helping Writers Become Authors, which is you know something I started to just kind of share my writing journey and, and it just kind of took off and it's something where I'm, I'm able to really explore more of the craft for myself as much as others and then turn that into um, the books that I do. Which is fantastic. And I just wanted to ask you there, because I mean, I have my own thoughts on this, but what do you think is the difference between a writer and an author and why did you <laughs> call you because your website wasn't always called that was it you changed the title of it that was helping writers become authors was actually the kind of the little subtitle there for a long time it was originally called wordplay mm. and then when i finally went ahead and bought my own domain name i i realized at that point you know that helping writers become authors was a much more pertinent title that made you know more sense to people who were actually looking for what i was doing but as for writers versus authors, really, it's just kind of semantics. But I think a lot of people consider, you know, anybody can be a writer. You know, you're scribbling and you're, you're a writer. But for a lot of people, I think author is more of a professional title where they take it, you know, a little bit further in their, their intent on getting published and getting paid for what they're doing. So for really, my intent is that you're taking something that is kind of a hobby and an interest and turning it into something that is really more something you're trying to be professional about and that kind of thing. Mm, no, and I, I agree with that. And I guess, you know, at the end of the day, the author has a book. So, yeah, yeah up until go. that point. Um, although I think, even think people with one book often struggle even to say they're an author. But maybe it takes two or three before you really feel it. Yeah, I, think I don't agree with. I encourage people, you know, if you're writing, you know, you should be able to claim that title. Because really, all the rest of it is just subjective success, you know, that we think we have to get to. And a lot of it isn't something that I think are actually the individual's priorities. So if you want to be a writer and you're writing, you are a writer. And if you want to be an author and you're pursuing this in a professional way, then as far as I'm concerned, you're an author. Ah, there we go. Excellent. <laughs> okay, so today we're talking about writer's block, which um, I've had a few emails about this recently and was really glad to see you have a book on it. Um, <laughs> but I wanted to say, so up front, you know, it, writer's block is not like a monolithic disease with one cause, one cure, and we're going to go into detail. But let's start, um, you know, what does writer's block feel like? You know, how do people know that they have it as such? And why is it so pervasive in the writing community? Well, I think, you know, like you say, it's kind of just this feeling. It's this nebulous black cloud kind of thing that is kind of hard to define. You know, people, it's just something's not working. And, um, but I, I like that you bring it back to a feeling because we all, even though we may not know what's causing it, what's going on here, we all know what that feels like. We know that feeling. And it's something that's very easy for us all to identify with. I like, um, I know you've read Stephen Pressfield's wonderful Art of War. Um, war of art rather <laughs> and um i love how he describes i don't know if he actually describes it as writer's block but he talks a lot about resistance 
Mm-hmm. And it's this feeling that I think everybody can relate to. It's just this feeling you can't move forward. Something's holding you back. And I think that's the essence of writer's block right there. And it's, it's just kind of this lost feeling, like you don't know how to move forward. So for me, I find that um, really the root of writer's block and being able to identify what's going on all starts with being able to find the right answer because you're asking the right question. Because if you can find the right question, it's like finding that loose end that you can kind of pull and the whole thing unravels. And I think that's where a lot of the the nebulousness and the lost feeling comes from is just because you don't know what's going on. And if you can figure out what's going on by asking the right question, then the whole thing suddenly becomes clear and you're not blocked anymore. I think that creativity is a hard thing. It's something, you know, if it was easy, we wouldn't be having this conversation. We probably wouldn't have jobs, really, when it comes True. down to it. Because I think it's it's something that is really difficult for all of us for a lot of reasons. There's a lot of fear involved a lot of times and a lot of uncertainty. And that's where that resistance comes from. So if we can figure out how to conquer that, that really helps us move forward and be able to find the, those right questions that are going to help us unravel our personal blocks mm. that are getting in our way. Yeah, and I mean, that feeling, I think we all do understand. But when is it just, um, there are a number of things it could be, laziness, uh, <laughs> pro- procrastination, um, you know, just t- being tired. Um, how long would, you know, should I, and it's, these are all terrible, and of course, these are all opinions, but how long is it before you can say, yeah, I'm really blocked? Like, <laughs> if people, someone just sits down and like an hour of going, oh, I don't really know what to write, that's not block, right? It's It's got to be a sustained period. Well, I think that there are, there's different levels of writer's block, definitely. Um, I think, you know, there's the, there's the minor blocks where you sit down at, for a day and you don't know where you're going, you're running into a story problem. You know, that is writer's block to an extent. It's just we don't always think of that when we think of capital W writer's block because it's something that's relatively easy to overcome. So the bigger blocks are usually, I find, much deeper personal issues. Like I kind of said, you know, fear is a big one, you know, that's holding people back, whatever, for whatever reason, for whatever personal reason. Um, I don't know that there's, you know, literally a time period that we can put on block. I think, you know, it's a very personal, it's a very personal experience. Mm. So for each person, you know, depending on how long this is going on and how dramatic it's starting to feel and the more resistance you're feeling and the the more, the harder it's going to be to overcome. But I would say, you know, if you're struggling this with, for this, for more than a couple of weeks, you know, if you're, if you're someone who tries to write on a regular basis and it's just not coming after a couple of weeks, then you know, that's, that's writer's block. And that's, that's definitely something that you you have to address it as writer's block and get down to it and, and start looking for the causes, the root causes that are obviously not there on the surface for you. Mm. So um, let's start with, you know, and there are different ones at different stages of the journey. So uh, first time author. And I mean, I wind the clock back like when I first met you, you know, I was writing nonfiction and um, I really do feel I had a block around the fact that I could write fiction. Like I was like, I could never write fiction. I don't have (laughs) enough ideas. And it's so funny now, you know, but I really believe that like I'd never have any ideas. I I don't know how to write fiction. Like, you know, how do I even start? Um, so if first time authors or people writing their first book say they have writer's block, <laughs> what are some of the practical ways they can fix some of those issues as a first time author? That's kind of interesting, actually, that you say that, because honestly, I had never considered that, you know, non writers at that point would have writer's block. So that's actually a very interesting um, point of view on that. I think it comes down to kind of what we were talking about, about just people dealing with fear issues and what's connected with that. And um, I think, you know, people who say, I I can never be a writer, I will never have enough ideas. I think that absolute negative statements like that are almost always wrong. So there's an absolute positive statement for you. Because they're, they're not, they're based on fear, they're based on Things like that, that, that just that nebulous feeling of resistance rather than an actual logical fact. So if you can just put aside that whole mindset that I could never do this and actually start exploring what's involved in doing it, 
then suddenly you kind of have a little roadmap for moving forward. And this is something that I recommend for writers in all stages. You know, I'm, I'm a big proponent of outlining and preparation. If you know, you know, what you need to do to move forward, if you can take kind of that, that overwhelming big picture and break it down into smaller steps so that you know what you have to do first, suddenly the whole thing becomes so much easier. Once an object in motion stays in motion, so if you can get going and, and know how to move forward, then everything becomes, I mean, it's still hard. It's still the same amount of work, but it becomes so much easier because at least you have a plan and you know where you're going. So for authors who are just starting out, that's definitely something that I recommend. You know, if you don't know what you want to write, if you don't know, if you don't have any idea how people do this, then just sit down and start learning about it. Start learning about the craft Start paying attention as you're reading uh, novels and watching movies and, you know, start just making little notes. Take it one little bite at a time until you're, you have enough, you know, material and ideas that you're able to then go ahead and start actually preparing an outline or something or, or, or going ahead and writing that first chapter. You know, if you're someone who's more inclined to pantsing it than you are to preparing it. Mm. And perhaps it's also like when you don't even know um, you know, when you're right at the beginning there and you don't even know what you're doing, it's learning, but it's also understanding that um, the book doesn't emerge fully formed from your mind to the page. So yes, exactly. You, what you write is a load of crap. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think people put so much pressure on themselves to be perfect, and that's, that's baloney. You know, I love the Ernest Hemingway quote where he says, we are all apprentices in a craft that no one ever masters. Mm. Because, first of all, it takes off... takes all this pressure off of us to be perfect. You know, if even Ernest Hemingway felt like he was never perfect, then certainly, you know, we have a little leeway there to work in. And also it's, you know, to me, it's really exciting because it's this continuing journey where there's always something new to learn and experience. And that's exciting. You know, it doesn't have to be frightening. It should be really exciting. And I think if, if writers can embrace that, that part of it, that it's, it's not a scary thing anymore. It's a really cool thing. Yeah. And I, I, both of us, I think, believe that this is a learned skill. This is something you can learn and improve at. This is not something you're, you're just born as this perfect writer. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I think, you know, talent does play a certain, or aptitude, let's say, does play mm -hmm. a certain um, role in it. But I definitely believe that passion and discipline are the ultimate uh, factors in a writer's success. Because if you have those, then you're going to come back and um, again and again and make it work. You know, we've all heard the statement about how someone with, with a ton of talent is never going to reach the same level of success as someone with a small amount of talent, but a ton of discipline and passion for what they're doing. Mm, and hard work over years. That's what I'm relying on anyway. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Same here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that's a kind of, um, you know, beginning writer. They can learn. Um, they can obviously find out lots on your website and on my website about these these things. Um, so let's take the kind of next level of block, which is an author um, who's in the middle of a book. And I think this is quite a common one, isn't it? So they might have lack of plot ideas. They might be bored, um, you know, <laughs> bored with their own book. Um, they might be trying to create a 90,000 word book out of a, sh you know, a novella size idea so what what are some of the other sort of blocks mid book and how can people deal with m those types of things well I think you know again it in solving them it always comes down to figuring out what is the source of the problem and I mean you just listed a ton of great ones and they're all different and they all have different different um, resolutions really so you know, the first step is always figuring out why am I blocked? Why am I feeling this resistance? And I think sometimes it's obvious and sometimes it's not. You know, if you're running into a story problem and you just have no idea how to move forward, that's pretty straightforward. But sometimes if you're bored or like you say, trying to, you know, expand word count or something, it's not always clear right away why you're struggling. Sometimes we're in denial, you know, we mm. don't want to be bored with this story that we've worked on for so long. So we have to be really honest with ourselves and really dig down deep and kind of just follow the, that resistance until we find its root cause. And like I said, once you find that, it's like so exciting. I think there's nothing worse than not knowing what's wrong. It's like um, 
a lot of people are overwhelmed in the revision stage. You know, they feel mm-hmm. like, oh my gosh, I've got all this, this work I have to do and it's just, I, I don't know where to start and it's horrible. And I totally feel that, you know, you start getting in all your um, suggestions from your editor and it's just like, oh my goodness, this is, I don't know, I, I don't know what to do. <laughs> and, but as soon as you like break that down and you have a path forward, that's exciting. You know, I think works, you know, having a ton of stuff you have to do is great. That's, that's, that's not what causes resistance. What causes resistance is you don't know the first step forward and you don't know how to, you know, all that work and actually do something productive with it and make it better. Mm -hmm. So what I always recommend is, you know, ask yourself lots of questions. And what I like to do is actually sit down with a notebook and a pen, because there's just something about writing longhand for me that really kind of just frees my creativity. Oh. Interact. I myself lots of questions. You know, why am I struggling with this? Why, or if it's a plot problem, you know, what what's going on here? What can I do to fix it? Um, and don't censor yourself, you know, because you're 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 wanting to throw all the stupid ideas, all the surface ideas out there, so that hopefully you can dig down and find the one that that's actually going to present you with a solution. And I will say that sometimes, too, when you're in the middle of a book and you're just you're blocked and you don't know how to move forward, sometimes you just need to take a break. You know, sometimes it's it's just burnout. Sometimes mm-hmm. your conscious brain is kind of overworked. I mean, I don't know how many times where I've you know been stuck on something in a story and, and trying to move through it. And I've I've worked on it and worked on it all day. And then I, you know, I'm just forget about it and go to bed and the next morning you know my subconscious has dug it up and the answer is right there in front of my face so Mm -hmm. sometimes if we can just give ourselves you know a little bit of space i think that that's huge in allowing us to then be able to kind of work through our issues and and come to the solution oh and i will say Hmm. don't be a drama queen about it i see so many authors who are you know oh i've got a writer's block it's the worst yeah exactly (laughs) the worst thing in the world and you know, this is just part of the business, you know, to whatever, to kind of learn to take it in stride and say, oh, yeah, today I'm blocked, you know, let's let's work on that today. Instead of it being this, this horrible life crisis, then it's much, much easier to manage. Yeah, so I wanted to ask there about um, the kind of finishing energy and that, you know, in the middle, because I've been thinking about this recently, like a lot of people have great starting energy, you know, they like start the book and and, and it's, it's really exciting. And then that boredom can set in if they don't have finishing energy. And I wondered mm. about your opinion on when should you or should you ever give up on finishing a story? So, you know, getting through that boredom part for me, and I, I hit it, I think everyone might do, um, is I just have to get through it and write, you know, write a good scene or just, you know, grin and bear it, basically. Um, but do you ever think that people should give up on a story? Um, or is that just, you know, block, writer's block winning? I think that's a really, really good question, because sooner or later, that's an issue that we all have to face. Um, I definitely, you know, my my standard advice to people is always, you know, finish the book. Because mm. I think there's no more important habit for a writer than getting into the habit of finishing. Because once you finish a manuscript, 99% of the problems can then be fixed. Um, but I do think there are exceptions. There are definitely exceptions where, for whatever reason, a book just isn't isn't working. It's not working for you, and it's it, you just kind of have to cut your losses and move on. And generally, I, I would still recommend that people actually finish, you know, the manuscript if at all possible, because a lot of times the things that you're facing in the middle, you know, you may work through them and get to the end and they may be may then be salvageable over the long run. But there comes a time where you just have to realize that for whatever reason, a novel isn't working. You know, it could be fundamentally broken. I had a story like that a couple of years ago that I, I mean, I love the story. I really did. And I finished the manuscript, but I just... It, I couldn't get it to work. It was fundamentally broken in what I wanted to accomplish and how I would have to actually do that. And then there's times when you just, you do lose interest. And I think, you know, there's a point where, like you say, we all get bored with the book after a certain point. And you have to be able to differentiate between just that standard boredom and just a general, I have zero passion for this project mm. anymore and being able to then move on to something that's more productive. Mm. But I think... You know, it, you have to be really careful with that because people get hung up on the, you know, the resistance of it. And it's it's so much easier to quit rather than to keep going. And it's easy to make excuses. 
about why you know you you would be better off if you moved on to a what seems like a new and more exciting story. So you have to be really aware of the habits that you're creating in in the choices that you make and whether or not to finish a story, because getting into the habit of completing novels is, I mean, it, that's that's the whole biz right there. If you can't do that, then you're you're not, frankly, an author because you're not you're not putting in the effort and the work to really make it to really see it through. And I think, you know, it's so, so easy to get in the habit, to get into bad habits of not finishing. And you have to be really careful with that because you don't want to put yourself in that position where you're you're breeding these these habits that are really going to come back and bite you in the long run. Mm, yeah, it seems like if you give up on one book or one story mm-hmm. or nonfiction book or whatever it's then easier to give up on another one and that's how yeah. people end up with like five unfinished <laughs> books in their drawer and um so I, yeah I think that finishing energy and I mean you've you've mentioned discipline and um you know I think the I, I read uh, like a definition of discipline is, is something to do with punishment and <laughs> I was thinking about this I was like oh it's kind of got negative connotations but then I was like do you know what the punishment is not finishing the book yeah yeah that, that like actually that. is the punishment isn't it so you, because you then feel like a, a bit of a failure because you haven't finished it mm-hmm. and also you don't have this thing that could potentially turn out to be life-changing for you and also other people so I think that um you know really attacking that block um that you know the lack of finishing energy or boredom like that's where you have to work it through get it done and then you can pay an editor to help you mm-hmm. make you know fix it can't you really yeah Yeah, I totally agree with that it's a very slippery slope to start down if you give in to the resistance yeah definitely okay so then let's talk about the author who has finished a book and um, especially at the moment what's really interesting with the indie community is this (laughs) you know you must write lots of books type of uh, (laughs) feeling and um, you know one yes of course, we we all know that you have you can't just write one book every year and expect to make a living. But I think um, the number of people who are burnt out is increasing dramatically. Mm-hmm. So um, <laughs> you know, and often like when I finish a novel, you know, I often feel I I am completely empty. I will never have another idea, um, and I think that's quite common. So how how do people fix that emptiness, the the sort of block of starting again? Well, it's interesting, actually, that you bring that up, because that's something that's really been on my mind on a personal level here lately. Um, And I've, you know, I've been fighting that, too, to some extent, that feeling of burnout and just trying to, you know, really keep my life balanced. And I think the secret is you have to know your priorities. And I think this is where a lot of, like you say, the people in the indie community right now are struggling, because we've taken this thing that we love, you know, this art, this creativity, and we've turned it into a business, a career, which is awesome. You know, it's, it's such an exciting time to be a writer because of that. But I think that it's so easy for the business side to take over for, you know, the, the, the pursuit of monetizing our art to take over because we all, want, we all have to live. And because there's such a feeling of success in being able to do this mm. with our art that it's, it just, it wants to take over. And sooner or later, so one day you wake up and you realize that basically you're back in the rat race because all of your focus is on the business side rather than the creative side. So I think it's really, really important for people to know their priorities. And if their priority is the business side, which is great, and that's totally fine. I'm not in any way saying that that's a bad thing. But if that's where their priority is, then, you know, churning out a couple of books a year or more, that's, you know, that's where they're going to have to be. Um, if their focus ultimately is on the art, you know, it's on the just the act of creativity and producing their fiction, then they're going to have to take a step back and realize that the art and the business are two separate things. And you have to really make sure that you're protecting the art side from the business side. And this is something that I'm, I really focus on pretty much every single day is making sure that I've created this space where my, my the cre- creative process is protected from all of the demands of um, actually, you know, making a business out of it and marketing it. And because all that stuff, can, I mean, it takes over your day and it can also take over your intent for what you're actually wanting to do 
with your fiction. You decide, oh, I need to write romance because that's where, you know, the, the largest readership is and I need to write more books every year. And none of those are bad things, but you have to make sure that you're doing them because they line up with your priorities and what you want mm -hmm. out of your artistic career. So once you've done that, it really gives you a better perspective of, you know, whether you're failing or succeeding in different areas. And so you can kind of make adjustments. We think it's important that you ha we have to pace ourselves mm. because, you know, I kind of like we were talking about before we started, we, um, you know, if you're a workaholic, it just, y you just feel like you have to be moving 110 miles all the time and you don't, you know, once you've got, you know, your systems in place and your, your business is you know, self-sufficient to some degree, then you can, you can back off from that a little bit and make sure that you're, you're nurturing the creative side, which is, is really the whole point. And if you lose that, then you lose the whole point of, you know, everything that you've been trying to succeed at. So I think it's really important to nurture that love of stories and to take care of your body. Um, it's, you know, we all know, I know this is something that you talk about a lot is, you know, sitting at a desk is not the healthiest lifestyle. So we have mm. to be really careful that we're not sacrificing important things, you know, like, like our love of our stories and our physical health and that we're creating a good balance of all of these things in our lives. Mm. No, I think that's that's exact, exactly right. And um, I actually did think of you um, this weekend while we're talking about work because um, <laughs> you, you're a, a, a Christian, aren't you? A person of, of faith. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. And um, I was I was actually at a, a church service yesterday and I, I was reading my favorite book of the Bible is Ecclesiastes. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I found uh, this uh, Ecclesiastes 224 says um, there is nothing better than to enjoy food and drink and to find satisfaction <laughs> in work. Yes. Um, these pleasures are from the hand of God. And it was so funny because I was sitting there thinking I need, you know, I've got so much work to do. <laughs> and I think in, you know, I, you know, and I, I've just taken two weeks holiday and it's really important to have a break. But then I read this and I was like, do you know what? We are meant to work. That is mm -hmm. what one of the joys of our life is to find work that we love. And so I feel very grateful about this. The problem I see is the rebalancing. So you're, I don't think there ever is balance. I think. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're constantly lurching from mm -hmm. one side to the other of like, oh, I need to look after my creativity. And then, mm -hmm. oh, I need to look after my business. And then, you know, and then like, oh, I need to have a rest. And so I, <laughs> <laughs> I feel like this, um, you know, this balancing is, ba you know, potentially, I mean, Ecclesiastes is, is uh, thousands of years old old you know um, book mm. and that this is clearly something that has always been a problem for <laughs> people in general <laughs> yeah I totally agree with that it's it is it just it's constantly is a recalibrating kind of defined to incorporate new things that you're trying to do and to find the new balance and um, but I also like you know in Ecclesiastics is the famous verses about there's a, a time for everything mm. so I think that that's really pertinent as well in that, you know, most of the time is the time to work and to enjoy, you know, like you say, I mean, I love my work. I love what I do and I feel so blessed to be able to do it. And then there's also a time, you know, to step back and reflect and, and take care of other areas of your life. So it just kind of depends on where you're at and what you're doing and, mm -hmm. and what you need to focus on at whatever place in your life you're at at the moment. Yeah. And as that applies to writer's block, it's like, OK, you know, if today it really just isn't working, then fair enough. Like, yeah. go have a coffee, chill out, whatever. Yeah, take a walk. Yeah. Yeah. But if tomorrow the same thing happens and the next day and the next day, then, you know, I'm sorry, just sit there and yeah. do the work. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I totally agree with that. It's a really good way to put it. Yeah, like, yeah, we, and it's very difficult, again, isn't it, to, to keep these things in check. But um, probably my number one tip uh, for this is set a deadline. <laughs> yeah. And then just, like, do it. I mean, how have you, uh, how have you ultimately overcome some of your personal blocks around these things? Well, for me, I always say that schedules are my secret weapon which is something that's really important just in general, you know, in making writing a business and making sure that you're, you know, doing everything that needs to be done, being responsible and accountable. But it's definitely true, you know, in my writing itself that I have, I learned this really early on and I'm so glad I did because it made all the difference, was that if I did not make my writing a priority every day, nobody was going to do it for me. Mm -hmm. And nobody was, you know, going to help me respect my own writing time if I didn't do that. 
So that was something that I did really early on was kind of just carved out two hours in my day and just made it sacrosanct to my writing. And, you know, it, there's a point where you have to protect after other people kind of get the idea that you're, you know, you're not available during this time. They'll leave you alone. And then it becomes really you're protecting it from yourself as much as anyone so that you're not, you know, goofing off on the Internet or, you know, pursuing something that's meaningful like the business side. Um, but that isn't what you're supposed to be doing, you know, which is the really hard stuff of actually, you know, creating fiction. Hmm. Well, I think for me, creating these schedules and then getting into the habit of doing them and sticking with them has been huge. Because when you get in the habit of showing up at your desk at a certain time of the day, every single day for years, I mean, it's, it becomes second nature. It's like getting up in the morning and having breakfast. And you don't, you don't think about it, you don't fear it, you don't dread it. It's just something you do. And you sit down and you, you're, you're going to write whether you are just flooded with inspiration or whether you're dealing with a block. You're going to keep moving forward because all of these wonderful habits are in place. I really love um, Somerset Mom's quote about how I only write when I'm inspired. And I make sure that I'm inspired every morning at 9 o'clock. Yeah. <laughs> because I mean to me that's how it works. You know, I don't I don't know I have never sat around and waited for inspiration. Because first of all, I feel like inspiration is always there. We just have to tap it. I think when people talk about, oh, I, I can only write when I'm inspired, what they're really talking about is more of a mood kind of a thing. And personally I do not want to be dependent on my moods for how consistent and productive and disciplined I am or how inspired. I am. And I will say that I have never stopped writing because of writer's block. Even when I'm dealing with something that just isn't working and I'm, I'm really struggling, I always show up at my desk. I always keep going. And I work through those writer's blocks so much more quickly than I would if I just kind of sat back and wallowed in it and did nothing to actually work through it. Yeah, I totally agree with you on that. And I wanted to come back on inspiration because as you were talking there, I was I was thinking that, you know, I, I just finished a novel and I'm writing a nonfiction book right now, but I'm starting the process of inspiration for the next novel. And for yeah. me, that involves um, travel. It involves a lot of research. I read a lot of books. I, you know, I, I write a lot of notes. I, I think you have to fill your head with stuff so that you can then create from that. Like you can't create from a completely empty mind. Um, so what are some of your recommendations for getting inspired? Because there's a lot in your book, even though, you know, it's partly to do with blocks. It's also to do with being inspired, isn't it? Yes, because ultimately, I think, I mean, writer's block is the problem. Inspiration is the antidote. So if you can find inspiration and these systems of, you know, creating inspiration in your life on a regular basis, then you don't have to worry about writer's block. But again, this is something actually that I have been thinking about a lot in my own life lately, which is um, what I call um, discovering the wonder in life. And it's something that, that sadly I have seen decrease in my life you know, as I get older. When, you know, when I was a child, my stories were there with me all the time. And I miss that as an adult that you know, I'm, I'm busy thinking about other things, about um, you know, work and the business side and you know, things that you know, aren't ultimately aren't as important to me as the actual creativity and the pursuit of inspiration. So that's something that as an adult, because it, it doesn't come as naturally as it did as a child, it's something that I have to focus on deliberately and make sure that I'm structuring into my life. And one of my favorite ways to do that is um, I love, it's, it's um, spring now, it's getting warmer, so it's, it's the warm time of the year here. And when you can go out, when I can go outside at night and have like a fire pit and the full moon and music playing in the background, to me, that's what I call like my dream zone. That's mm -hmm. my magic spot where I can just kind of sink into my, um, my subconscious and let my imagination just kind of take over. And that's where I find, you know, just the really interesting and special ideas for what I'm doing. Because I feel like they're not, it's not that my conscious brain isn't totally capable of coming up with, you know, great ideas. But that's, I think, where the really special and interesting things, you know, just kind of well up because they're not in any way harnessed by um, an outside stimulus that my conscious brain is filtering. And um, Robert Lee Brewer, if you're familiar with him, he has a really great book called From Where You Dream. 
and he t- in it he talks about kind of the same thing, but getting into what he calls the dream zone, and um, really using that to kind of just fuel your inspiration. So that's something that I try to do on a regular basis. Um, I also try, you know, to just to let go of the stress of thing, whatever it is that's, you know, in, involving my mind in things that really aren't that necessary. And instead trying, you know, to go in the other direction and, and follow more of the creative thing. So that it's just, it's there with me all the time, every day. And it's, it's just, it just feels like a really healthy, energizing thing. So if I can tap into that, then I never have to worry about the whole resistance side or the writer's block side of things. Mm. And I mean, you mentioned scheduling and I diarize everything as well. And <laughs> I do find, especially given what you and I do, which is the nonfiction and the mm-hmm. fiction, that yeah. I need to schedule them separately. Like if I, you know, I almost need to not do anything on my blog or the podcast or interviews like this. Or, you know, I, I kind of need to be JF Penn completely mm-hmm. separately to my nonfiction and business um business work and it it's not a quick to me that bit like you're saying that getting into the dream zone it's not a quick process like mm, i think no. that that's the bit before you maybe before you've done the outline or before you start writing mm-hmm. like you actually need quite an intense uh, or longer period of just thinking don't you and mm-hmm. letting your brain have time yeah definitely for me um in my my creative process is it, it tends to be a little bit slower than a lot of people's but I, you know, I get an idea and it usually sits in my head for a long time. I'm busy on other things, you know, working through other deadlines and projects and books. Um, so I've got, I, my ideas sit in my head for years sometimes, which I love. It's like this, this period where they just kind of get to, you know, be in this warm, safe place where they can grow and really mature. And I can see, you know, what interesting directions it's going to go in that I know I would never discover if my conscious brain just totally took over and started constructing a story so I love it when it gets to just sit in my the back of my head for a couple of years and I'll you know take it out and kind of play with it every now and then and and add new stuff to it and then by the time I'm actually ready to start outlining you know I have generally a pretty complete idea of the story and and lots of different scenes that I want to work on and then I can just kind of start my outlining process by connecting the dots between all of these things and figuring out how they all fit together. But the longer that it can kind of sit around in my brain and be a part of this dream zone kind of a thing, then the better stuff I actually have to work with by the time I sit down to write. Mm, no, I, I definitely agree with that. And um, we're running out of time. We could talk about this forever. <laughs> um, but I did I did just want to ask you briefly about longevity. Um, as I mentioned just to you before we started recording, um, you know, I've known you online, I think, since we both kind of started with our blog, sort of 2008, 2009-ish. Um, mm-hmm. I think we, you know, met on Twitter or something back then. And, and we were both nominated, I think, for the top 10 blogs for writers. Mm-hmm. I think it was 2011. Um, wow. Yeah, I think it's kind of, I know, <laughs> we, we're, we're just so old in this career now. Um, yeah. But I wanted to ask about, you know, what, how do you ensure longevity in both a creative career and a sort of online career? And, and how do you keep inspiration going for that for the long term? Well, I think that for me, definitely what I, I have been learning and, you know, as you say, it's always kind of a, a, a period of readjusting, constant readjusting as you're, you're always learning new things and having new experiences. But I think for me, definitely, like I've kind of said, you know, I, it's really important to me to know what my priorities are and to make sure that I'm filtering out the static of everybody else and, you know, kind of what the world is telling you your priorities should be. So that I'm, I'm always very focused on making sure that I'm lined up with what I actually want to accomplish and that I'm not, you know, letting myself feel bad or pressured or whatever because I'm not measuring up to someone else's standards. So to me, that's, that's always the first step because if I'm, if, I'm try, if I'm chasing my tail trying to fulfill something that I don't actually believe in, then I think that's the fastest track to burnout and dissatisfaction, just the whole thing not working and coming down. Um, but as far as, you know, actually writing and achieving longevity in that, again, I think for me, making sure everything's scheduled so that everything has its spot, that the fiction has its spot. It, for me, it gets precedence. It's the first thing I do in the morning. And so that's kind of my morning work before I look at the Internet, before I do anything so that it's, it's a very calm and a kind of a peaceful period of my day where I can just 
you know, focus on, on energizing this story. And then having, you know, the, the, the schedule for the nonfiction and for taking care of all the internet and the marketing stuff so that everything is, has its place in my day so that I'm not overwhelmed by any of it, hopefully. Mm -hmm. And I, so I can finish each day, you know, in a healthy place. And I'm not, because I know, you know, because I definitely don't observe that perfectly all the time. And, and there comes a point where I am doing too much in one area, usually the business side. And I can tell, you know, I'm just, I'm run down, I'm, I'm out of steam and I'm, I've lost, you know, I'm losing my energy for the creative stuff as well. So it's very important to me to protect, like I've said, my creativity and to kind of, to think of it as you know, a child is something that I have to nurture and take care of every day. For me, it's really important to make sure that I'm prioritizing that and nurturing it and protecting it and feeding it every single day. And if I can keep that healthy, you know, because I'm doing all of that, then that is what allows me to have, you know, the energy to pursue something um, as far as longevity goes, you know, on a long term basis. Mm, no, that's great. And then uh, just just about blogging, um, as I mentioned, you know, you and I have both been blogging as a non as nonfiction authors um, for for a long time now. Um, but we're also fiction authors. So what what is your opinion? And and I guess what part does blogging play in your uh, nonfiction life versus your fiction life? Well, I, you know, I started blogging way back, like you said, um, basically just because at that point it was the mantra was every writer needs a blog. That was like the thing that we were supposed to do that was magically supposed to, you know, jumpstart your whole book marketing. So, of course, I did it. And um, as you know, most authors are confused about what to actually write. What am I going to write that's actually going to interest people? So I tried a couple of different things. But what interested me most, obviously, was the writing. So I just kind of started sharing about things I was learning and where I was at in my writing. And, it, you know, it took off, obviously, on its own. It became its own thing. But I am I'm just, as a, on a personal level, I'm just so thankful for the blog because I, I have probably, I mean, I know I have learned far more from it than anyone who reads it has. And, you know, I'm sure you've heard it too, the statement that those who can do and those who can't teach. And I totally disagree with that. I think that's absolute nonsense mm. because nothing has taught me more than teaching. Mm. I know for a fact that I would never have, you know, been spurred on to learn some of the things that I have pursued and then to have to actually iterate them in a way that, that they have become part of me much more deeply than they would have if I just read them you know, in someone else's book and moved on. So my blog has been just an absolute huge blessing to me on so many levels. It allowed me to connect with so many great people, including yourself, and um, so many great readers. And it's, it's a joy to be able to help other people in their process. But if I'm being totally honest, you know, the, the best thing about it is how much it has helped me and challenged me to um, be a better writer. Oh, no, I think that's that's great. And it is interesting, isn't it? Because I say like for a fiction author, you just don't have to blog like I just don't believe you do anymore. Yeah. I actually think you're probably better off writing novellas, you know, using your words to write more fiction and put it out there. Um, but I, as I say that, I'm also like, do you know what? My blog changed my life. <laughs> yeah, it, exactly. <laughs> it, it really did. And I wouldn't be without it. You know, it, it plays a very significant part in my income. But, you know, as you say, I get to do my podcast and, and meet and network with people. And that does help sell fiction and, and also other books. And and yeah, I've learned so much too. So, you know, do you, do you, what do you recommend to people? Do you say, yes, it's a good idea still, or do you say it's not? Well, that's, I mean, that's a really good point. And I agree with it. You know, I think that the vast majority of people who start a blog, that it's probably not going to be super helpful to them in their marketing efforts. But then, you know, you have one out of every 10 people who, you know, for whatever reason, it, it connects and it takes off and it turns into a really good thing for them on, you know, on the marketing level, but also on a personal level. So ultimately, I think it's a very subjective um, bit of advice. But for people who are drawn to the idea of blogging and have ideas about things that they want to share, then I say, yes, definitely. You'll, you'll probably find it um, rewarding in and of itself. Mm. Um, and then hopefully it'll also take off and do, you know, be helpful to you as a platform. If you're resistant to the idea of blogging, you have no idea what you want to blog about, and you just hate the whole idea, then don't. 
there are so many you know options open to us as authors right now for other things we can do to build our platform and and write a book so i think that it definitely hasn't been something that's been super helpful to me as a fiction author so i you know i can attest to that and i would say that you know if you're not interested in it on its own merits and attracted to it and you don't think that you'll find it personally rewarding that you can probably find some better ways to invest your time for marketing your book. Mm, yeah. Oh, well, you know, I'm, I'm really grateful for, for your blog. I think you share all kinds of really interesting stuff. Um, so why don't you just tell people a bit more about what they can find at your, your site and what other books you have there? Yes. Yeah, so I post twice a week. I post on Mondays and Fridays. And my site is totally focused on writing how to craft. I don't get into the business side of um, that, mostly because you do such a good job of it that I just send people <laughs> over there. Um, but yeah, I post a lot. I'm really into story theory and the whole idea of um, creating strong story structure and using that to create strong character arcs and just really exploring the the intricacies of the practicalities of writing and and if we do this, then this will help um, readers feel the way we want them to and react the way we want them to. So I'm always studying and breaking down um, books and movies and using them as examples of why this works and why this doesn't work. And um, I actually have a um, my first online writing course coming out pretty soon here, probably today, actually. Oh. Um, Mastering character arcs, so that's kind of exciting. And then I'm going to be working on a character arcs book for later this year because a lot of you know a lot of people have been wanting that. And then uh, on a more personal level, I'm actually going to be starting outlining my next book, which will be a sequel to my Portal Fantasy Dreamlander here pretty soon. So I've been taking a break this month, so it's, I've got to get back in the harness here full-blown here next week <laughs> <laughs> fantastic so just remind people again where they can find you and uh, your books and your websites online yes so my uh, writing website is helping writers become authors.com and if you're interested in my fiction you can find more about that on my personal site which is km wyland which is my name is spelled w-e-i-l-a-n-d Dot com. And of course, you can find all the books on Amazon and Barnes and Noble and you know, all of those online retailers. Fantastic. Well, thanks so much for your time, Katie. That was great. Well, thanks for having me. It was a lot of fun.